Uh, my name is Elise. I'm an educator here. I was a teacher for 20 years. I taught every grade from pre-K to high school, and since I've been here, I have taught educators. I've taught college students. I was also a children's librarian for a number of years, and I arrived here, and this is by far the best job that I've had. Uh, and I really love being a teacher, but I, I love this job. And I love it because everybody gets 100. Everybody's <laughs> always right. Um, it's really important to let people connect to the art, whether it's children, students, right? We're all subject, art is subjective. We come with a load of experiences that we can never really communicate to each other. Um, so it feels good to be reassured whether you're a professional in the art world or just a, you know, a patron at the museum, that um, your voice is being heard. And the theory of the museum now is we want to spark curiosity, um, engage with the community, and have conversations. So while you're all very knowledgeable, as I'm knowledgeable about the art, the, I'm not here to um, give you more information. You do research on your own, you're um, geared towards certain pieces more than others, and that's just also subjective to you, right? Um, what I'm here to do is model some ways that you can get the information out there without just talking the whole time, and you're going to elicit information from the viewer that's going to support what you want to convey about the art. So, I'll go in and out of roll. I will treat this like you are children, and um, then I'll step out and I'll tell you what my thoughts are behind that um, often. So we are in the ancient Mediterranean gallery, and this gallery covers three different areas. It covers Greece, Rome, and Egypt, right? And there's so many different ways you can come at this gallery. You can come at it from um, materials. You can come at it from the standpoint of history and how civilizations have evolved and um, all the different aspects of living life on this planet, right? So whether it be um, folk art and things that are used as decorative and useful, um, just the history of certain people, um, how we uh, connect to others, how we connect to animals, how we connect to possibly the afterlife. Um, lots of different ways. So when you come in and you look at this space, I'm going to stick with Egypt uh, for now, but what I also want to do is be able to make some connections for you to other areas in the museum. The idea is you have your tour, people come in, they're with you for 45 minutes, and it was a great uh, day, but you certainly don't want to say bye and then they go out the door. We want them to spend the day here, and if not, we want them to come back another day. So you're going to be able to give them some direction based on your own experiences and the connections that you make here in the museum. So the first thing that I always like to do is point out that for the most part, when people come to a museum, they feel obligated to see everything, right? So they're going around and they're saying, <laughs> right? And in our world, we do it very differently. We want some deep look. And I'll tell the students, like, we're going to look at this for two minutes. Um, we're going to look at it for five minutes. Then they're like, oh, are we going to look at it for an hour? Well, maybe we are going to look at it for an hour. You know, um, I look at these pieces over and over again. And I just saw uh, on Willie G, I'd never seen his name written on the top right hand corner. His name is printed on that painting. I must have spoken that painting. 150 times, and I actually just noticed it. So there's always something else to notice, something else to have a conversation about, and hopefully something else to inspire um, the visitor and the viewer. So I'd like you to come a little bit closer, and I'd like you just to take a minute and take a look at this piece. Um, and then I'd like to hear some of your immediate thoughts and responses after looking at this. A lot of tattoos. A lot of tattoos, great. <laughs> Interesting view. Yes, tattoos. Why do two of them have white hats? Why do two of them have white hats? You have to see that as well. One two. You can't see it from all the way back there. Come closer, you won't be in the way of the camera. What's it made of, right? So we're all kind of looking at 
different aspects of this. Some of us are questioning the material. Some of, our, of us are trying to analyze uh, the details. Maybe some of us are trying to put it into a time frame, right? And that's all relevant and great. And you're not going to be able to say everything about every piece, especially in a gallery like this, because a lot of these pieces are not attributed to specific artists. So it's hard to do research. Um, for me, I'm comfortable saying I don't know to uh, a group of students. Or if I feel a little less comfortable, I'll kind of suggest, well, this is something that maybe you can research at home or you know, talk about in class. Um, but I don't feel the need to ever blow it out of proportion, let anybody think that I know absolutely everything. Because if I did, I wouldn't probably want to be here anymore. So um, what is it made out of? What do you think it's made out of? Wood. 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 This is actually the lid of a coffin. Uh, a lot of times we go, well, do we have the bottom? Is there anything in it? No, we don't have the bottom. There is nothing in it. This is the lid of a coffin from 1075 to 954 BCE. I like to sometimes qualify what BCE is. Many people remember AD and BC, and we've come to a different approach where we want to be respectful of all people who maybe don't believe in Christ. So BCE now is before Common Era, and rather than using AD, they're using CE, which stands for Common Era. Um, so that's a that's a cool kind of thing, and um, that can have a conversation of its own, right? How come it's not water if it's made out of wood? How come it's not rotten if it's made out of wood? Well, if you think about some of the sculptures that we have, like the headdress in Africa, um, those things were treated consistently year after year. The epi headdress was repainted and resealed every year. So I imagine, to a degree, this was treated beforehand. And that's another thing that we can talk about. Um, this is a coffin lid. Who do you think it belonged to? Who was Hennemare? Was Hennemare a man or a woman? Woman. Woman. You're sure? sure? Why do we know that, I mean, didn't men have long hair in ancient Egypt? So how do we know that this is not a man then? Hair decorations. Hair decorations. Coal on the eyes. Coal on the eyes. And that's a great conversation, right? This is the beginning of makeup, right? The idea of um, your appearance is really important in this ancient Egyptian uh, society. Do we know that men did not use yeah. coal? Men did, right. some men did, um, but that is a good distinction for the most part. Um, and she is not royalty. Okay, Hennemar was not royalty. She's not a Cleopatra, um, but she did have a uh, social status. And we can read the information, and that's another thing I always encourage the students. It's not cheating if you read the label, uh, but we can also sort of read these images and gain a lot of information about who she was. If you wanted to touch on the makeup thing and the idea of um, appearance and the need of that, you could also tie in mirror. The mirror was basically invented in this Egyptian society, at this, in this ancient society. And the idea of being able to see your reflection was really important. So, I'd like you to look at this black line and I'd like you to look at the image above the line and below the line and tell me what you see. There's like a beetle above it. There's, a, be yeah, there's a scarab beetle. Oh. And um, do you know, and it's holding something. It looks like it's holding some sort of a ball or a skier, a round circle. Mm -hmm. um, do you know anything about scarab beetles? Do you know what... Scarab is the actual amulet or medallion that would be created from these beetles, but the beetles themselves are dung beetles, and you know what dung beetles are, right? You know what dung is. Dung is poop. So, um, let's look at it from the ancient Egyptian standpoint. This beetle is holding this sphere, this round ball, because in ancient 
uh, Egyptian society, they worshipped the sun. So this is an image of this beetle, from their standpoint, worshipping the sun god Ra. They create this because this is what they see the beetles actually doing. They're gathering up um, material, rolling it into a ball, going off and dying, and all of a sudden, reincarnation is happening. A new life is coming out of, uh, out of this ball. And for the ancient Egyptians, they believe that this beetle has the secret to reincarnation. So it's revealed, right? Now, looking at it from a science standpoint, and you can direct your visitors to go up to Dynamic Earth and take a look in our um, African um, savanna portion of that gallery, and you can see dung beetles there, along with the lioness and the gazelle and these other things. And unbeknownst to the ancient Egyptians, um, these beetles aren't uh, worshiping the sun god Ra. They are doing this deliberately to preserve their babies, right? So the dirt that they're gathering up is dung, and what is dung? Who from other animals, right? So why would they do that? Why would they bury their babies' um, eggs in, in nutrients? Nutrients keep them warm. Protection in what way? Uh, so predators don't. Right, you got a little antelope or gazelle walking along looking for some um, insect eggs. Comes across that, gonna keep on moving, <laughs> right? Um, incubation, <laughs> it's gonna keep it nice and cool like a mud bath during the day in the hot desert. At night, the temperatures drop. This little ball has been uh, heating up all day, so it's gonna keep those babies warm. The great thing to know is that um, the larva actually grows into a full-size beetle before it emerges from the ball, hence the supportive idea that the um, this is reincarnation, right? Um, and how does it make its way out? So there's the nutrients. The nutrients are coming in. There's nutrients in this. And I, I get a kick out of this. I really do. I ask the students when I tell them that, how yeah, do So I ask them, in case I feel like turning any vegetarians, and say, well, how many of you eat shrimp? Right? These are bottom feeders. This is the perfect idea of uh, recycling, right? We are recycling, we're keeping everything green and clean because that's nature, right? So we see that this is a good part of the um, spiritual and sort of religious aspect of this. But then below, what do we see? A falcon, maybe? Something with wings, right? Mm, some type of a horn, some type of instrument is um, turned toward her face, and we believe that these are the stories of this person, right? Um, so what could that be? A horn, what else could it be? Turned toward her face. You can get closer if Maybe you can't see it. Maybe a goblet or a drinking vessel of some kind, right? Um, a pipe, maybe, right? Uh, so, you know, you want to have the visitor get close and, and take a guess. Um, and then, based on what they say, you're going to be able to expound a little bit more. Um, I don't need one of these because I can project really well. But if I wasn't able to project really well, what would I need? A microphone. So, this tells the story of Henry Mayer, who happened to be a, a songstress, a priestess, right? So she's like the ancient Egyptian Beyonce. Um, it's great to make reference, right? Depending on who your audience is, give them some reference or your own um, references. So that representation would be her. That would be her, exactly. And that's another thing that I wanted to talk about um, about the preservation of this. Um, so she was a songstress and a priestess, so she had some uh, social status, and if, if they created this when she had already passed away, um, number one, it would have taken a really long time, 
Number two, this is something that is in process for years. You know that you're going to die. You're going to have one of these created. It's going to tell the important parts of your life. And it's going to represent you in this very vain sort of society. It's going to represent you when you look most beautiful. Right? So she may have lived a very long life. I don't know how long she lived, but this representation of her is probably when she's it's like in her the New, York, New York Times obituary and someone dies and they really give you a picture and they say they're, they're 92 years old. Right. But the photo was exactly. from her. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So um, then where we talked about those white hats, which I don't know um, exactly who that is meant to be. Some of these are prayers. Some of these are actually um, stories about her and her own personal life and experiences. So she was a wife and a mother also. Um, some of these faces have animal heads on them. So you can also ask what the visitor sees. And then you can speculate together. Because the idea is not that you're, you, they can do research at home and they can look at this image or they can search on their phones. They don't really need you to get all the information. You're here to engage them and connect with them and everybody wants to feel heard and you know, acknowledged. So you can ask them, what, what do they think it is? What do you think these represent? And so if you look close, you can see different things with like fans and other birds, um, other images. And that can tie into many of these other pieces. Like I mentioned, you could tie in um, the mirror, or you could tie in these. Because again, these are coffin lids. And um, does anyone know the term of the um, wrapped cadaver? What is the term for that? The mummy. mummy. The mummy, and that, that wrapping is the sarcophagus. Uh, so, what is the story with these uh, birds? Pets? <laughs> Pets were um, revered, right? We know cats were revered in um, ancient Egypt. And pets may have been revered. You probably had to have some social stature also to be able to afford to have one of these created for your uh, falcon or your bird. But did they serve any other purposes? Did they go to the afterlife with them? Mm -hmm. Maybe. What about when they were alive? Were they just there for pleasure in their homes? And you see, they were all over Egypt in the temples, representing Did they have a job? Do you think they, they had a job to kill the hunting? Hunting, hunting, maybe? Messengers, right? They were, oh, were, they were messengers, they were the mail service. Say they were absolutely, many of them were revered and sacred, but they also served a purpose. They had jobs, right? And uh, you hate to lose your best employee, so maybe you wrap him up and you treat him really good and he's reincarnated and he comes back to you. That's a fake. That's a fake mummy. This, oh, inside here? Yes. This one? That's dirt. Uh-huh. And um, seeds. Right. And if it... Um, gets wet in a room. It's a sign. Right, yeah, that's what it says here. Yeah, that's wonderful too. It's just that notion of rebirth, right? Um, and you can tie in things again in popular culture like Harry Potter. You know, do you know of any other situations where birds are used and revered as messengers? Many, many people, adults and children, know about uh, Harry Potter. So, you can shift in between some of these uh, pieces in this area, or if you wanted to, you could stick with the idea of wood and then go elsewhere and talk about that. You know, it depends on where you, what connections you're making and where you're able to um, engage the people. I mean, I know we all want to give information, but the best way to give it is to lead someone to say what you what you want to elaborate on. Would she be that tall? I would think. It's not really that tall. Like if we were standing on here, I think she might be a little bit taller than me. Um, and it reminds me of the uh, 
Maybe she also wanted to be taller, <laughs> too. So if she's going to be reincarnated, um, she'd like to be a little bit taller. We get to get it right in the afterlife. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Get it right. Exactly. Well, especially if you have a question. I know, right? That, I don't think so. I, I couldn't say 100%. Um, that would be something that we would need to ask. Who's the curator for it? What do you have to train you? If it's just a long year. Don't have one. Yeah. yeah. And, and it looks yeah. as though it's been there. It does yeah. hopefully. It does say, does it just say it does so? Hey, it does mm -hmm. It's just so. Just so it's a type of paint. Hey, it's, it's, it's like a filler. But, you've seen the but it has color. color. Just so it's color. Yeah. yeah. And so it's almost know, like a tinted glass. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Do you all have any questions for Elise about this work or her methodology? I just have one thing that's bothering me, and that is that we were always taught that that was Mott. Mott? What's that? Oh, really? I never heard that. I, I there was did Mott. not learn that. And who is Mott? Mott is um, the goddess who. Um, is in the sky and swallows the sun and lets go of the moon and then lets go of the sun again. Goes through your, her system. Mm -hmm. I mean, there could be inspiration of Hennick wanting to be like Mott, but I am relatively certain that that is specifically her? about her because of the microphone. Um, that would make perfect sense. Yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, and that's but the thing, why, too. Why was, I mean, it's always been. Well, I think with it, her wings but maybe she's just being represented, being represented, being personified as, for, as, as a right. goddess. Exactly. Because exactly. 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 I think they're Osiris, aren't they? I, mean, mm -hmm. I can't remember. I, I think it could be also, but I yeah. I can't say. You know, if we had the um, Stars of the Pharaohs program going on in the planetarium, which we did, that was a great tie in. So sometimes you can really support other galleries. You can support multiple galleries, mm -hmm. uh, depending on what it is and what is being shown at that time. If we went to Rome and we were talking about the glass, you'd make a great connection to um, unexpected color, right? right? Or the, the stained glass windows. Um, you're, you're, you're here sort of to sell, right? Our, our <laughs> ideas and our, and our galleries. Sell it, yeah. Right? And then if, if someone wants to talk about the jewelry, you could go and look at the jewelry. Yeah. The cats are wearing jewelry. They're adorned. You go up and look. You suggest they go there. And then, of course, you suggest they go to the wonderful gift shop <laughs> that has some of the most unique. <laughs> and, and really, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it if I didn't believe it. I spent a lot of money in there. I just have, I just have a question or as an observation. I'm curious other people's thoughts. Mm -hmm. Does the there's a, the same woman, and I'm assuming it represents her right. coming down all the way down on the left and all the way down on the right, right, with the same headband, sort of the two right. on a row, right? Okay. And some of them are, from what I have learned, some of them are um, specific instances or experiences, part of her own personal history, and then other of others of them are like prayers or hopes for the hopeful uh, reincarnation and, and the next life. Her progress in another world. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's so rich with hieroglyphics. But, you know, like and that's the thing too. It's like an I spy game almost. Yeah, you is. just see, you can it find is. so many things and on it. And you can have a great little short conversation about the idea of hieroglyphics and modern hieroglyphics. We're using them every day. Yep. They're emojis, you know, yep. we're using them every day. Are you so, are you still like to talk about that uh, her hair? Uh -huh. Because we used to have also in the African gallery a whole exhibition of, of hair. hair. You know? Mm -hmm. But that because it's and I have a few educators that even when they're doing the tour of um, Express Africa, they'll start here because, like we said, these are the these are the yeah. origins of civilizations and ideas. So Egypt is Africa. <laughs> Egypt is Africa. <laughs> Don't forget. Right. Yes. I love that. You know, I did not know that one was in there. It took, I would yes. looked in this gallery for probably an hour for uh, the pomegranate, yeah. and, and then we were like, oh, the pomegranate's in that yeah. room. I was and like, perfume, makeup, it all goes to the. Mm -hmm. Right. 
definitely, and you can even go even further in there, and um, if you wanted to go with the portraits and the photographs that are in there, and, and the one particular one, uh, the Faso, where the guys are yeah. all um, like that, you know, that particular photographer, the idea in, in Mali was you wanted to be photographed by him and then go look at his little shack studio the next day to see if you made the wall. Yeah. You know, it's like the red carpet. Are you going to be yeah. put up there? Yeah. Um, so this notion of appearance, I mean, that goes throughout the museum. Any other questions, mm -hmm. comments? This was reinterpreted, I'm, I'm guessing it could be as long as 20 years ago. Have you seen anything of the interpretation and the updated interpretation of the hieroglyphs? I haven't I have seen not. it either. No. I have not. We haven't had a, a curator for this gallery uh, no. since I started. So uh, there hasn't been, while we, when we do training, we're training um, the way the education department has consistently trained. Mm -hmm. But it's always great to have a fresh eye. Yeah, we don't if have you have fresh eyes. No, we don't have fresh eyes either. There is one of the things that we were taught, this is a long time ago when I first was training, is that the goddess Nut, you had the goddess Ma, who was protecting her, right. which is this one. Right. Okay, and then you had the goddess Nut, and the goddess Nut uh, was the goddess of truth. Right. And she's always represented with feathers. Okay. And one of the tests that um, is supposed to be in here, I never found it, um, that the goddess Nut gives to Aunt Mare is that um, if her heart is lighter than the feather, then she can go on to the underworld. If it's not, then she gets gobbled up. Oh, that's a great yes. tie into the Norman Bloom. I love that tie into the Norman Bloom oh, <laughs> to Persephone. Mm -hmm. You see, I mean, and that's yeah. Yeah. this is the benefit of me not talking the whole time is that I'm learning something from you. We're having a conversation. Well, I learned something about the yeah, like right, and and that's what I mean. When I do teachers, when I'm with you, when I'm with little children, I may be a little bit more animated than the kids, <laughs> but I'm still having the same conversations because it really I like internalized it, um, and I love it. You know, and I'm sure you all love it. <laughs> right? So you must love doing this. Mm -hmm. So that's what, if that comes out and the, uh, the visitor is, is experiencing the that, the, the visitors, right? To get the people. Exactly. So then it's, it's a huge, it's a huge success. And it, it's, it's all about this consistent learning and talking. And I told Megan, she said, are you sure we have time? Uh, I like, just asked you like two hours ago. I said, absolutely. Like, I want to do it. Because also it's refreshing for me. You know, you come with a lot more knowledge than the average visitor, so I can take stuff from you. The goddess Nut, the story of the goddess Nut. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, and that was a big part of the um, of the Stars of the Pharaohs program. She was mentioned quite a bit in that program, um, and I don't know exactly how they schedule um, things in the planetarium if it's. If you can just request, can we have this show for a group? I, I believe that you can do that. Yeah, I think when a group right. books, so yeah. So I think like if you have a booked group and you want to extend that and get in touch with the people in the planetarium, that's a great, great time. way. And it's more, there might be more inclined to go and see that show rather than just coming out of nowhere and going to the planetarium. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. All right, thank you, Elise. Thank you so much. You're